Large Hadron Collider is the largest and most powerful particle accelerator ever built. Located at CERN in Geneva, it started its operation back in 2008 and is now warming up for its third run, which is due to begin by the end of this year. One of the key motivations for the construction of the LHC was to try to detect the Higgs boson, an elementary particle predicted by the standard model of particle physics. The Higgs boson was discovered at the LHC in 2012 and it was a huge success for the standard model because it was the last missing piece. So is that it? Do we have all the ingredients we need to explain the universe? The short answer is no. Although the standard model describes ordinary matter, which makes up 5% of the known universe, we still don't know how to incorporate dark matter, dark energy or gravity with the standard model. Many extensions to the standard model impact the properties of the Higgs boson. Therefore, if we can understand the properties of the Higgs boson in great detail, we can narrow down the number of alternative theories. To do that, we need a machine capable of making very precise measurements. Among many different proposed future colliders, a new machine is leading the race for its construction. The International Linear Collider, or the ILC, will be a 30 kilometer long straight machine that will involve collisions between electrons, which are charged leptons, and its antimatter counterpart, positrons at up to 1 TeV, an unprecedented energy for a lepton collider. But why do we need to build a new machine? What new physics are we hoping to find and where will it be built? To answer these questions, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Philip Burroughs, Director of the John Adams Institute for Accelerator Science at the University of Oxford. So thank you very much, Professor Burroughs, for giving up some of your time today to join us on the Oxford Department of Physics YouTube channel. Um, we're very excited to have you. So today's topic is on uh, future linear colliders. So I will begin by asking my first question, which is what is a linear collider and how are particles accelerated? Well, thank you very much, Colette. That's, uh, of course, a, a great uh, opening question for this, uh, this video. So um, a linear collider is basically what it says on the tin. It's um, a way of accelerating subatomic particles to very high energies, but using um, linear accelerators. And we would have two of them. And in a linear electron positron collider, we would put the electrons in one end of one of the linax, and we put the positrons in at the other end of the other linac. And then we basically use um, electromagnetic accelerating technology to accelerate both beams of particles to very high energies so that when they meet one another in the middle where the collisions occur uh, we would get the maximum center of mass energy that we could achieve given the um, linear accelerators that we have available. Thank you and um, please could you explain a little bit more about what a LINAC is? Right so so a LINAC is a piece of jargon uh, which stands for linear accelerator and so you can think of it as a sort of long tube um, that contains um, accelerating uh, cavities. They're, they're, in the jargon, they're radio frequency accelerating cavities, which means that we set up electromagnetic waves inside these cavities, and then the subatomic particles surf the electromagnetic waves as they travel down the linux, and by surfing the waves, they gain energy from the electromagnetic waves. And it, it's analogous to the process of a, of a surfer on an ocean wave on, his, on the, his or her surfboard. And as they surf the ocean wave, they gain energy and they travel faster. And so it's very similar for the um, particles in the linear accelerator. Thank you. Um, so we have linear colliders and we also can get circular colliders. What are the differences between the two? So again, that, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, I think probably most people are, are most familiar with big circular um, particle colliders, such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And, um, I mean, obviously, again, the difference is exactly what it says in the tin. In a circular collider, the particles are going round and round. Um, so in the case of the, the protons at the Large Hadron Collider, each beam of protons is going around about 11,000 times um, a second and you have two beams going in, in opposite directions, and then at four places around the ring, you get collisions um, between the two beams of counter-rotating protons. So a linear collider operates um, essentially according to the same principles, 
except obviously um, you, if you've got these two um, linux pointing at one another, um, because the particles, when they interact in the middle, the beams of particles become degraded. We can't reuse um, those particles after collision. So typically in the linear collider, in the designs that we have for these future colliders, um, you, you pulse the, um, the beams down the two linux um, with the the ILC, for example, the International Linear Collider, we plan to do this with a frequency of about five hertz or pulsing the Linux five times per second and creating crea collisions in the middle at that rate. And so that's, uh, if you like, a big difference with respect to circular colliders. In circular colliders, the beams keep going around and they keep coming back. In linear uh, colliders, you have to create the particles, accelerate them, collide them, and do that as fast as you can, which in practice for a collider such as the International Linear Collider means roughly five times per second, or in the design for the Compact Linear Collider at CERN, that might be 50 times per second. Thank you. So you mentioned the International Linear Collider and the Compact Linear Collider. And what will these colliders be used for and what kind of physics are we hoping to find with them? So the main um, purpose for any future linear electron positron collider is to serve as what we call um, a Higgs boson factory or Higgs factory. So a facility for mass producing, um, hopefully samples of hundreds of thousands of Higgs bosons. And we would do that um, because when an electron and a positron uh, collide and they annihilate one another. If they have sufficiently high energies, we can create in the detector a Higgs boson in association with, for example, a Z boson. And so we can make wonderfully clean events in which the only things we have um, to light up the detector are the Higgs boson in association with a Z boson. And we now know since the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, that if we build an electron positron collider with a center of mass energy of about 250 GeV or roughly 250 times the mass of a proton available, we can make a Higgs boson and a Z boson. And with the performance that we plan or the, the luminosity as it's called in the jargon for the ILC or for CLIC, we would expect to be able to make roughly 100,000 to uh, 1 million um, Higgs bosons, depending upon how long we run the accelerator for. And then what we want to do, of course, is to really um, uh, pick apart the Higgs boson and understand, is it the Higgs boson of the standard model, as predicted by Peter Higgs and um, Anglais and Brout and others, is it perhaps uh, a non-standard model Higgs boson? Perhaps it's one of the supersymmetric Higgs bosons that you might expect um, in supersymmetry or SUSY models, or is it perhaps something even more complicated? Maybe it's a composite object and it's not actually truly a fundamental um, particle at all. And so we want to use these big data samples of hundreds of thousands of Higgs bosons to really pick apart the Higgs boson uh, through its decays, uh, to the different species of quarks and leptons and the decays to gauge bosons. And by measuring these different decay modes very, very precisely, we can say, are they consistent with what we would expect from the standard model? Do we see deviations from standard model behavior? If so, the pattern of those deviations will give us uh, a clue as to what the new physics might be if it's beyond standard model physics. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of uh, physics discovery potential there for the new colliders. Um, so with the colliders that you've mentioned, what sorts of energies will they operate at and how do these differ from the energies of pre-existing and existing colliders? Right, so the, the design energy for the first stage of the International Linear Collider is 250 GeV or 250 billion electron volts of energy in the center of mass. And that's uh, chosen because um, as we now know, following the 2012 discovery, we know the mass of the Higgs boson. And so we know the energy that we need to put in in the electron-positron annihilations to make a Higgs and a Z. 
And it turns out that the cross-section or the rate of production of the Higgs particles through that process peaks at about 250 GeV. So the energy threshold is around 216 GeV, and then the cross-section rises very rapidly and it peaks at 250. And so we'd like to sit at the, the peak of the cross-section to maximize the production rate of the Higgs boson. And that means that the ILC, for example, would start at 250 GeV. Now we know that um, there are other interesting processes at higher energies. Um, and so we would definitely want to increase the energy of the collider. And one obvious uh, energy is 350 GeV because that would allow us to do electron positron annihilations and to make a, a top quark and an anti top quark in the final state. And um, these TT bar, so called TT bar events, pop anti pop events are really interesting because the top quark is the heaviest known um, elementary particle. Um, and therefore, it gives us a window into, into new physics that couples at high mass scales. So we would definitely want to mass produce top and anti top quark, uh, uh, quarks in TT bar events. And so we know we'd want to go to 350 GeV for sure. And then if we want to study the Higgs boson in association with the top quark, we would, would want to go to at least 500 GeV in the center of mass. And similarly, if we want to make pairs of Higgs bosons uh, in association with the Z boson, we need a little bit more energy and we would want to go to five or 600 GeV in the center of mass to make these um, other new um, heavy final states. And of course, ultimately, um, we, we don't know what new physics might be out there. Mm -hmm. So we would like the capability to go to as high center of mass energies as we possibly can. For the, for the ILC, effectively, that means around one TeV. That's when the technology for the ILC really starts to sort of poop out beyond mm -hmm. center of mass energies above about a TeV. For, for CLIC, for the other linear collider, the compact linear collider that's been discussed for realization at CERN, um, in fact, we have a design that could take us all the way up to three TeV in the center of mass. Now, at the moment, we don't know um, exactly you know, what ultimate center of mass energy we might want to achieve um, with any of these colliders, but clearly the capability to go to the, as high as you can um, is, a, is a really important tool to have. Um, and in fact, if the LHC discovers some new particles, perhaps Susie particles or, or, or other new types of particles, um, then that will give us a clue as to the maximum center of mass energy that we should design for the ILC or for CLIC. So we're certainly looking to the, um, the LHC for, for physics guidance, and we very much hope that new particles will be discovered there over the next few years and through the high luminosity LHC years that will, that will help us to design the energy for the ILC or for CLIC. Thank you. Um, and what is the status of the design and construction of the ILC and CLIC? So um, the ILC, um, actually the technical design report for the ILC was completed back in 2013. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the ILC has really been in a, in a state of readiness um, since 2013, and we've been um, looking to Japan, which has um, made indications that, um, that the project could be hosted in Japan. And so we've been watching and waiting for uh, political developments to take place in Japan uh, since then. And indeed, it looks like things are now really starting to move in Japan. Um, there's a big effort on the ground among local politicians, among national politicians, and indeed, even among members of the government um, to really look at um, implementing the ILC in the northern region of Japan, just north of the city of Sendai. So that is a construction ready project that in many ways is, is ready to go. I mean, there are a few technical issues that need to be sorted out over the next few years before you would actually say, uh, right, bring in the bulldozers. But basically that's a construction ready project that could be implemented in Japan we hope within the next five years. Click, um, the technology for Click is um, still at a, at a developmental stage. We've got proofs of principle of all of the technologies we need to build Click, but um, we certainly would like to build larger scale accelerator systems with the Click accelerating technology. 
um, before we would feel uh, fully ready uh, to pull the trigger and say, let's go and build a you know, 10 kilometer long um, version of Click. But the technology is, is there. Um, it's, it's all demonstrated there are no showstoppers. And what we would like to see, for example, is the um, construction of a free electron laser um, based upon Click technology. Uh, at a scale of order hundreds of meters um, long uh, Linux based upon this technology. And then we would feel ready uh, to take a construction decision within the next 10 years or so. Please, could you explain a little bit more about what a free electron laser is? So a free electron laser um, is really a, a sort of, it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely state-of-the-art way of making um, very, very high power beams of X-rays. So we've known how to make X-rays in particle accelerators for, for you know, 50 years. Um, if, you, if you take a circular accelerator and you put electrons in a circular accelerator, as the electrons go around, they radiate X-rays. That's absolutely wonderful for people who want to use the X-rays to, to look at the properties of, of matter. For example, structural biologists um, uh, use this technique routinely. And a lot of work has been going on recently, for example, on, on COVID, um, using X-ray beams all around the world uh, to look at the, um, at the, you know, the DNA level of, of, the, of what the COVID, um, uh, COVID disease is and how it works and, and, and gain information that might help us to develop vaccines and so on. So using the X-rays for biomedical research is, is, a, rich, uh, is a rich field of science. Um, but of course, if you're a high energy physicist, um, having the, the particles lose energy as they go around um, the ring is not an advantage. And so uh, that's one reason why linear accelerators were developed uh, in order to, to avoid this so-called synchrotron radiation of X-rays. But it turns out you can use the, um, the electron Linux uh, to create what we call a free electron laser. So if you cunningly uh, get all of the electrons um, in the beam um, to oscillate, you can get them to radiate um, X-rays um, coherently, and you can get um, fluxes or intensities of X-rays which are up to 10 orders of magnitude higher than the X-ray fluxes that are possible in a, in a conventional uh, circular um, X-ray synchrotron. So it's another example of, of how uh, you know, developments in one area of science through linear accelerators being developed for particle physics has led to a spin-off um, of free electron lasers that can then be used uh, to study materials properties uh, in, uh, in surface science, in, in structural biology, in, in condensed matter physics and so on. Oh, that's a great answer, Phil. Thank you. Um, so I guess that brings us on to my final question, which is, um, what would you say to young students who want to pursue a career in particle physics or accelerator science? So I, I, I'm not uh, the first person to say this, but it's absolutely true and I firmly believe it. There has never been a better time to be a particle physicist or an accelerator physicist. We are in a situation now where we know that normal atomic matter, which has been, uh, you know, the, the particles of the standard model that make up normal atomic matter have been revealed over the last hundred years of experimentation in particle physics using the tools developed by accelerator science. And we know today that, that these particles, normal atomic matter, only constitutes roughly 95% of the mass energy content of the universe. And so um, we are looking to the next generations of uh, uh, high energy physicists to figure out what the other 95% of the mass content of the universe is made of. We were pretty sure that 25% of it is in the form of dark matter, but we have no idea what the dark matter is. Um, um, it could be made of um, elementary uh, constituents um, weakly interacting um, massive particles as predicted by supersymmetry for example or, or it could be something else we have no idea so we don't understand dark matter we don't understand dark energy that constitutes 70 percent of the mass um, energy budget of the universe and so there are all these wonderful scientific questions to address where did half the universe go to 
So uh, all of the antimatter that was created in the Big Bang uh, is no longer out there in the universe today. So it's presumably uh, um, decayed into matter. And we don't really understand how that has happened. So where did the original half of the universe go? Uh, where is all the antimatter? So amazing scientific questions that require answers. And then, of course, in terms of tools and technologies to address those questions, um, there's so much R&D to do both uh, for particle physics detectors, precision instrumentation to detect the new particles that we create in these accelerators of the future, but also the accelerators themselves. I mean, we've already talked about, um, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers in circumference. You've got these linear colliders of order 10 kilometers long. If we could have in everybody's garage or basement a particle accelerator like the LHC or like the ILC, then of course uh, it will be a wonderful world and everybody could be um, a high energy physicist. And the reason we can't is because they're, they're very large and very expensive facilities and so we can only have a small number of them around the world. So if we can get the next generation working on advanced particle accelerator R&D, then there is a hope that perhaps we can all have one of these machines uh, in our back garden. Um, so there's so much to do on the R&D side, so much to do on the physics side, um, and uh, please come and join us. Oh, thank you so much, Phil. Um, so unless there's anything else that you wanted to add, then I think it's probably a good time to end the video there. Um, so I thank you again, Professor Burroughs, for your time, your knowledge and expertise on future linear colliders. Thank you very much, Coletti. It was great fun and thank you for your very probing and insightful questions. As you can see, there is still a long way to go until we fully understand our universe. Hundreds of people from all over the world are making a huge collective effort to try and take particle physics to the next stage and to try and uncover some of the mysteries of the universe with these new and complex machines. It's a truly amazing endeavour and if it excites you as much as it excites me, then please get involved. Thank you for watching.